Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight is a very special night. It's Australian Kangaroo Connection Night, and we're going to be tying the flies, but we've got some help from our friends in Australia. More on that in just a moment. Our weekly tip this week is going to be a couple of things in relation to the muddler nymph. What is that? Well, you'll have to hang on and find out. But for right now, we're the BDs from Boise, Idaho. Tonight, we're going to be um, focusing on our Australian connection. And it came to us in kind of an unusual way. Let me, let me click up a PowerPoint here real quick. The Australian connection. It's uh, our thanks to Robin Shenton and Paul Fidelis from Port Macquarie, New South Wales, Australia. But there's another person involved before we get to the, to the two stars for tonight. And that's another fellow that I met the same way that the rest of us met. And that is via the Fly Tying Group Fly Pattern Award. It started out with uh, checking flies uh, for the Bronze Award for Lyle Crawford in Canberra, Australia. Uh, I think that's the Australian Capital Territory. Anyway, ACT is what they call it. And anyway, just to kind of give a flavor for tonight, he's also studying now for his um, master casting instructor. And he has a, a nice lawn area across the road from his house that he's put in so we can practice. And there's his rod and all this stuff. And uh, most of the time there's mobs, as he calls them, of kangaroos. And in the right-hand picture, you'll notice that there's a hillside with little dots all over it. Well, you probably can't see it real clear, but I sat and zoomed in with my uh, uh, Photoshop and I counted 33 kangaroos scattered over that hillside. So anyway, just to let you know that when Paul and Robin talk about kangaroos, they're, uh, they're not joking. They, they have a couple, three of them down there. This is, this is the, the story and it's going to start from right here. Um, after meeting Robin and Lyle via email, I was their um, um, a pat pattern reviewer after their flies had been evaluated by Jim Ferguson, as it turns out. And anyway, in communication with Robin, we kind of communicated back and forth. And he says, you know, you ought to meet, at least via email, a friend of mine. And that was, that was Paul. He said he's from the U.S., but he's been living here for 50 years, so he's almost Australian. And I said, well, that sounds great. And in, and in the process, I met and got to be really good friends with Robin and Paul, both of whom you're going to meet here in a, few, in a little bit. So anyway, I, I sent them each a care package of some goodies from the U.S. that they can't get in Australia. And in the mail, this is what came by return from Robin. It's a piece of kangaroo hide. And we're going to uh, be working with that tonight. But we're going to start out by spotlighting Robin. You're going to tell us about the kangaroo hide and any other adventures that you want to talk about. And I'm going to unspotlight me. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Al. Um, first of all, um, for my wonder what my accent is, I'm actually not Australian by birth. I'm actually a, what they call a pommy. I come from England and uh, I came out to Australia in 1970. As regards uh, fly fishing and fly tying, um, I'm actually quite a, um, a recent uh, uh, party to that, having um, joined the uh, Hastings Fly Fishers Club in 2014 when I moved from Canberra. So that's a, a bit of a background. Now, as regards kangaroo, this little guy here, which I send Al, when it comes to roadkill, a lot of species of birds and animals which are on the side of the road, even though they're deceased, are still protected by law. So one has to be mindful about getting roadkill. Though I carry in the back of my car plastic bags, um, gloves and secateurs in case something happens to fall into the boot of my car as I'm driving. So that's how I got hold of, um, uh, of this um, um, kangaroo skin. Now, I just might mention, if I can, Al, I tied some flies. Now, um, I tie nymphs with them. Um, uh, it's a bit hard to see, I think. Um, I was a bit worried about um, how they come across. Um, this fly here is actually... Yeah, they're, 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 it's just a straightforward little nymph. What I've done with this one here, I've actually tied it uh, Gary Lafayne Payne style. I've actually um, made a dubbing loop with the kangaroo and added some um, um, peacock, um, um, uh, a um, 
UV light. This one here. Anyway, it's Spirit River and um, Mottle Nymph Blend. Okay. Pluro okay. Cerise. Now, when you put a, light, a UV light on that, it really lights up. It's just, and this other one here is, um, as I said, the same thing with uh, a um, silver inverted tungsten beading just behind the neck. Yep. I've, again, I've wrapped some of that fluoro cerise, um, and um, it's really a hot spot. So when I put a UV light on it, it really highlights um, those um, flies. These are designed to get down, obviously, a bit low. And being an inverted tungsten bead, it actually fishes that way up. My other favourite place I like to fish um, is uh, the snowy um, snowy mountains. Um, it, um, it's in the Alpine area. And so that's about all I've got to say initially. Um, other than um, I'm, I feel a bit out of my depth sometimes when I hear people like yourself and Jim talking have been part time for 60 years. And here's me, a young 73 chappy, just sort of with my all plates on. I really appreciate you both wearing your club shirt and your and your hat. And I'm getting ready now to to introduce. Uh, this is Paul. He is my Australian American friend. Um, got to be a really good friend, I would say, in a short time. So, Paul, oh, welcome to BT's Fly Time Friday. Huh? Ex Marine. Ex Marine. Yes, he was in. Oh, no, no ex Marine. Once oh, a Marine, no ex -Marine. Always, right. a Marine. always a Marine. Yes, you are a Marine. That's yeah. correct. <laughs> Hence the reason for no cover inside. That's right. <laughs> um, first off, I'm banned from roadkill. Is that your wife? Yeah, I'm, I'm driving along and I see a, a dead fox and the words were, don't you dare. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got a primary school show and tell here. So I'll go through that. Um, we don't have really good fly tying acts. Uh, fly tying access to fly tying materials and those we get are really costly due to uh, shipping costs exchange rate and the fact that it's a seller's market and so they charge you through the nose uh, for example i just bought something that i needed fairly quickly and that from a local guy who was a friend of mine and it only cost me 35 dollars for just a few things and and so the problem when i first came is that um I didn't have any fly, any supplies. And so so you had to, what you do is I call it, I had to marine it. You improvise, adapt, and overcome, right? And uh, my flying toss, fly tying philosophy is fairly rough. Nature is not neat. Bugs are happy, or sorry, bugs are buggy. Ugly is good. Most of the stuff that the fish eats, I'm looking at the camera, I should look at the camera, right? Like you do. Right. <laughs> Most of the stuff that the fish eats is already in some form of trouble. All right. So if you don't have the right color, the right feathers or any other material, use what you got. I think the bottom view of the fly is more important than the top view. The top is for the fish fishermen and the bottom is for the uh, fish. And the profiles are important. Profiles and proportions are key. Uh, a tetra pen covers a lot of mistakes. And Al confirmed my ideas with his fishing humpy and his Prince Nymphs. <laughs> oh, I'm I, I, got, I got to put in a plug for J.S. Stockard, which is uh, the stuff I buy from in the U.S. And their shipping costs are cheaper than most everybody else's. So I'll put that plug in. Um, I'm going to switch cameras now <clears throat> for my show and tell. Okay, for my um, thread, I use sheer 14.0 and a lot of woolly nylon. The sheer, if, it, if it's small or it floats, I use the sheer, which I get from the U.S. Or anything else which big and sinks, I use woolly nylon. I like woolly nylon. It's like stretch over locking thread, if you can see it. it uh, put that in front. I'm worse than you are, Robin. And it's $8.50 for 1,500 meters, which is good. I'm on my second roll of black. And one other thing I use, which you get from the um, 
the market is invisible thread. You know, it's a sewing invisible thread. I use that a lot. I got wire. I get wire from stereo wire, large stereo wire, and, and this cable for when well, you buy a meter and it costs a dollar. The metallic embroidery thread. I'll explain this later. This 3M double sided tape, two different kinds. And I just, the other, today I just tried it. I made an extended body with it. It's a little, it's a little dog ball. Okay, now the other thing is wings. I use plastic bags. And um, for the, the fly that we're talking about, this is the dividing paper inside a photo album. The other one is the, um, I bought some wings like this. They're real small scanned it and expanded it and made them bigger so I, you can make different sizes. But when you print it, you know, when your overhead projector things, you can get all different sizes. So you can make them either bigger or smaller. And I use, I use all these brushes for, the, for my flies. This one's a shaving brush. And when you take it apart, you get brown or you can get just solid white. And the next one is flash. Getting flash is hard. And this is called fringe, all right? And this is, I don't know what to use the fringe for a sewing. And they're all these different colors. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. So you cut them up, you cut them up in strips like that and then share them with everybody else and you still have enough flash forever. Okay, the first one is the Yendor Pinky, which is a flathead fly. One of the club members came with up. This is plastic tubing, which you buy at the Chinese shop and you get all that for $2. And the next one is um, a salmon fly. And this was done by one of the, the uh, members of the Sydney club, Raj Daiwa. And he came out and we're using the double, double sided tape, 3M double sided tape. You put it on the fly and you get, you get the fly here that has the, the shine on it, 3M tape, which is clear. So I use that on these flies. Initially, I was peeling off the, the, um, the covering because you got you know two sides and you got the 3M on the one side. And then I thought, why bother the red on because it actually looks like blood. The salmon are going like crazy eating all the white bait, which is about these sizes here. You cast your, your fly into the, into the, the maelstrom of fish going crazy with a clear sinking line and a 20 pound um, test and you start stripping like crazy. And then the, the salmon attack it and you catch fish with that. One of the women at the club showed me a fly here and all I did was take that crystal flash and then put eyes on it and then coated it with um, Sally Hansen's and I used that the last time we went fishing. The next fly is a glow bug. People put, get the pom-poms at the store and put the pom-poms on the hook, but then it fills most of the hook up with the pom-pom and you got to clear it. So what I did is you can see how I, I take invisible thread in a needle, put the pom-pom on a piece of foam and shove the needle straight down through the pom-pom tied on top of the hook. And so you, you got the wide gate and you're on top of that hook. And I call this a Madame X blowfly. And the main thing is, is I use the embroidery thread here to, for the body. I use some of this flash here. Make your body with the embroidery thread, fold the foam over, tie it down and fold this stuff over the top of the thing. And what I do is I cover, coat the back of the um, Sally Hanses and that means you, this crystal flash will stick to it. And then all you do is, is make a post Put the rubber legs on. Now this stuff here is sil siliconized polyester for three dollars. Wow. And that's a, it's the a stuffing they use for bears, you know, the teddy bears. Yeah. What I've done here is I've made a scud Ziploc bag as a um, wing case strand of thread at the back and you use that as your rib. The other one here is in Australia, not a lot of water. And what the people did when they came in is they planted willows along the 
along the streams. <laughs> They're sort of a pain in the butt now, but the willows, while they use a lot of water, it's someone told me, one of the old timers told me that it's when there's no grass that the cows will eat the willow. Okay. And so the willows have what they call willow grubs. Now that's what these are. Well, this one's from Tasmania and that's a, a you know, one from uh, Victoria. And when the willow grubs are there, the trout don't eat anything but willow grubs. And so I came, came back and I used this um, ultra chenille, which gets you a willow grub because when the grubs go into the water, they go into a circle. And so you get that little bit here and, and uh, they just drift along and I use those willow grubs. Now, this thread here, this embroidery thread is good for um, red flies, which they, the black fish, which is a saltwater fish. Now, the other one was we have trouble getting the, um, you know, the willow, woolly worms. You know, when you get your woolly worm, we don't have the long, the real long pieces. And so I used all the short pieces. I used three pieces of this to make one of these flies. Now, and the last one, I got the kangaroo hopper. And what I've done, so this is the first three. I tie the feather around it. You cut it, the top of it off. Here, I tied in this one. I, after you finish that, I tied in the legs. And then this one here, I tied in the legs first. And on this one, I tied in the tail, the um, wing first. Now the wing material looks like that. When you put it on, trim your fly, you trim the back so it's right in the line with the body. Now what I've done here is I've used the um, silicone, silicone material for the, the um, post. I've got the body in, I've got the legs in. I haven't made the little notch in the legs and I have the feather. I got the last two feathers, the last two flies here. Ones with the silicone, ones with just a pair of posts. And I will put my email via chat. How's that? There you go. <clears throat> Any questions? This is my fly. This is the orange bass flopper, which is the go-to fly for the Hastings Club when they're fishing for bass. Uh huh. Okay. And that how to tie that is on the website. Okay. It is very, when you fish it, you use your excellent skills and you slap it down as hard as you can, and just let it sit there and then move it and twitch it. Or if you're really good, you can bounce it off one of the limbs into the water. And that's it. I'm done. Thank you. Oh, one last thing. Sorry. <laughs> you can't shut me off. You can't get me going. <laughs> Robin tied this fly for me. This fly is awesome. When you look at that fly, each one of those feathers, there's only three. I'm not sure what you call the parts of the, the feather, but there's three different things. So each one of those has got nine feathers. And I always tease Robin, his flies are too good to put in the water. Okay, Paul, one, one thing before you go, um, <clears throat> you have to talk about this. I'm going to bring it up on the PowerPoint. We yep. got to talk about your fly storage system. Oh, okay, my fly storage system. After you fill up a whole bunch of boxes, and, uh, you know, because I just like tying flies. I have too many flies. I mean, I probably would never use them. You know, I, I would use the orange bass flopper. But you got all those different flies. And it's easier to saw. And if you wanted to go away, you can pretty much put them in your pocket. Put, put them in your pack. You know, and otherwise you wind up with 14 pounds of fly boxes. This is a, I've never tied this fly before. <clears throat> I've tied a lot of wolves, but this one has never happened. The first one will be in tonight's um, presentation but we might as well go take a look if you want to take a picture of that it's probably the only time you're ever going to see this recipe in in real life because after tonight i'll probably retire the fly forever but anyway it's 
a roo wolf, which the A stands for Australia. Roo obviously is a kangaroo and king uh, and the wolf part. I think you can figure that, that out, but let's go to the materials. And here's a piece of kangaroo that I got from Robin. Hooks, the hackle, I'm gonna set the hackle already sized. I'll just put that over there at the tying area. I've talked a dozen times about um, which hair to use. You want the um, dark hair on the animal's hide. This is a deer, a picture of a deer hide. And you want the hair that's along the backbone. That makes the very best wings and tails for humpies and wolves and so forth. I'm not gonna go into the full explanation like I usually do. Just suffice it to say, this is some of the stuff that you want. And I've got one of my primo pieces of, of wing and tail hair out right here. And we're gonna get started with that. Starting it at uh, about one third back from the hook eye. That's and wrapping good. from the one third area right back to the to the end of the shank where the bend starts. And then I'm gonna come back about halfway and stop. That's gonna be the area that's going to, that I'm going to deer here over here at the imperial vice. I'll just cut that out. Set my stacker aside and let me pull out any of the waste fibers we've got here. And I need to get rid of a little bit. I've got a little bit too much for the tail. And how much is too much? Well, there's a couple of ways that we've shown you to, to gauge the volume of hair that goes into any particular um, hair, hair tail on a, on a hair wing fly. And one is to just take the bundle of stacked hair and give it a twist, a half twist, and compare that bundle at the twist over point to the outside diameter of the hook eye. And I think you can see that that's pretty close to the, the volume that I need. The other way we'll uh, talk about it at another time, but we do the, the pinch method where we pinch it and compare it to the gap of the hook. I'm gonna measure this tail now for length, which is equal to the length of the hook shank. Notice that I set it down on the side of the hook nearest me. So that way when I tighten up these turns of thread, it will place the material up on top with thread torque. I want you to notice that that dense dark hair from the backbone of the animal, that it does not flare. It just makes, makes a nice compressed tail. And that's what we want. Trim off the waist and wrap forward to the one third position. Now slip over here to the materials and get another bundle of that deer hair. And on my way back to the vise, I'm just going to stop and rapidly run my finger up and down through the waist end again, just over the trash bin, getting rid of the waste. We want a bundle of hair that's larger than the tail. And I think you'll agree that that looks to be in volume to be about twice the size of the tail. And that's what we want, because we want two wings sticking up that are about the same volume as the tail. That will balance the fly. So I'm gonna measure it for length, set it in place, on the side of the hook nearest me, and just like I did with the tail, and then allow thread torque to reposition that material up on top of the hook. Notice that he didn't tie it right, or set it right next to the tail, end of the tail, because when he cuts it, then it, the cut reaches the tail. Right, it reaches the tail. And I also want you to notice that I laid my scissors in flat along the shank. That makes a really severe cut, so that when I blend the waist from the wings, into the waist from the tail makes a pretty smooth transition there. And I can guarantee you, you can cover up a bad transition with dubbing and it looks great until you get the fly wet on the water. And then, well, um, unfortunately, it's, uh, it, the bump is gonna show. Now there's a couple of ways to stand these wings up. And most people stand the wings up on their hair wing flies by just wrapping a thread dam in front. And you know, multiple turns will force that hair to stand up and it'll look pretty good until you open your fly box a week later and all your wings are tilted forward like that. Now let me back up. I'm gonna show you how to stand up the wings in this hair wing. And you do it in steps. You don't try to conquer the whole world at once, you conquer just a little bit at a time. And you start with just a few of the fibers in the wing, stand them up, 
Now you see those are already standing up pretty nice. Now we'll go to the next bundle, next part of the bundle, like rephrase. Take a wrap in between. Anyway, and I'll keep working my way forward now. You kind of have an idea of what I'm doing. you're pulling back. Uh, yes, I'm pulling back to really jam it in there. All right. And I probably about one more. And then I'll stand up the rest with a thread dam that I wrap in front, just like most people would have done with their wings in the first place. And I'll just quickly <clears throat> build up a thread dam. I want you to notice that I'm building my thread dam. I don't try to wrap everything tied up against the wings because it's going to slip off. So what I keep doing is I keep coming forward just a little bit further into the bare area of the hook. And then I go right back up the ramp. And what I'm doing is a progressively building ramps into that, into that wing. All right, now I'm going to twist my vise and take a look at my bundle of hair here. You see, I've got it kind of fanned out. Let me turn this a little bit more. Maybe there, you can see it a lot better there. Let me just kind of divide the in half. Now I'm going to have to turn this a little bit so I can see what's going on. Because when I turn it towards the camera, I can't quite see. So I will take a wrap in between those two bundles, just like that. And now I got to twist it around just a little bit so I can get to it. And I'll take a turn after taking that wrap around. I'll take a turn around the bundle and then around the hook. And that anchors that off wing in place. Now I'm going to just bring this back straight so that I can do the near side wing with a couple of thread turns. And I'm going to need one crisscross wrap just to anchor it right there. And let's take a look and make sure that they look okay. Yep, look pretty good. Uh, the offside wing is a little fuller than the other side wing. Now here's a trick that uh, you're getting a, a free trick tonight. The way you make perfect wings is a thing called scissors. Okay, now they're even. You just get rid of the, the part that, that was too much. There's a stray fiber there. Okay, so now I've got my body built and now it comes to time for the kangaroo. Well, I'm just gonna cut some of the fur right here. And I want you to notice that I just got a bundle of fur there in my fingers. And I'm going to take that over to the vise, and I'm just going to use that to dub. We call this raw dubbing, meaning that we uh, apply it right straight from the hide. Let me get my dubbing wax. And I'm just uh, kind of making the thread nice and sticky. Now here's, I'm going to try something again. I've never done this before, so I don't know if this is going to work or not. I'm just going to hold on to the very tips of that bundle that I cut off of the hide. And I'm going to see if the wax will grab the fibers that I need to make a nicely dubbed body. And it does just by holding on to that bundle on the very tips. Now, what you don't want to do, it's just like regular dubbing, is you don't hold it in a death grip like that. You hold it by the very, very tips so that the sticky wax can pull fibers out of the bundle. But that that makes a pretty good, pretty good smooth applic even application on the thread. Let me uh, twist in a clockwise do direction in preparation to wrap this this thread or this dubbed thread. And this is an interesting dubbing. We we dubbed with it once before on another night when Robin wasn't here. And that's why we wanted to redo this, but you know, this is a, I like this stuff. I think nice and nymph. this is, um, yeah, well, we're gonna be doing a nymph here in just a minute, but um, it's really buggy. But anyway, uh, I'm gonna just put a little bit more of this hair. And this time, rather than just using the wax, I'm just gonna pull a little tuft out of the bundle like that. And wrap it into place. And now it's time to add my hackles.
This is almost like the LaFontaine werewolf. And he tied that with um, just like this, except uh, he used hare's ear for the body. I'll just take these two hackles right here. They seem to be. Robin says there's no guard hair on any of the hide. No guard hair on any of the hide. So that uh, that's good if you don't want guard hairs in your dubby. That's bad if you're looking for guard hairs. <clears throat> now I'll just tie this on. <clears throat> and I want you to notice that I'm leaving some bare stem floating in the breeze, if you will, so that when I go to wrap my, my feather, I don't end up with fiber sticking towards the back of the hook. Now I want you to notice that I did not wrap the thread all the way forward to the hook eye. I stopped because when I wrap my first feather, I want to have a nice delicate head as an end result. And the way I get that is by stopping that first feather just shy of the hook eye because the second feather will be tied off right at the hook eye. And though I'm wrapping two feathers, uh, the end result is a head that only has one feather hidden under it. Now I'll pull that back and I want you to notice, I, in fact, I can zoom in here, I think, yeah. Let me take a quick zoom on this. You can see I've got some bare area right in here where I'm going to wrap the last bit of my thread, which does two things. It forces that hackle to stand up straight. And it also gives me a position on which to wrap the last feather. So let me zoom back out. Let me trim off the first feather. And now we're going to wrap the second feather. And I'm making sure that I fill in any spaces remaining from the wrapping of that first feather. Okay. <clears throat> Second turn to anchor it. And now I'm, I'm going to do a jam knot and dog leg that hackle at the same time, wrapping a thread head that forces that hackle back and also builds a nice thread head without any hackle fibers trapped in it. Okay, let me get my whip finish tool. Placing a whip finish starting at the back of the head, each subsequent turn getting closer to the hook eye. All right. Now that will push some of the hackle fibers back. So I down dress the fibers forward to make sure that I don't have any of them sticking back when I want them all nice and straight in line. And there's the finished fly. Okay, well on to the, the tip of the night. And it's really a pretty simple one. If you'll go back to the vice Gretchen, now what I need to do is to just get a size two nymph hook. And I'm gonna talk about the nymph hook that we're gonna share with you tonight is one that I call a BB nymph. That's B like in Bravo, B like in Bravo, BB. And you know what that stands for? Before beads. Yep, before beads. There was a time in the US when we didn't even know what a bead head was. In fact, I remember when they first arrived on our shores, it was the early 90s when they started showing up. But prior to that, my absolute go-to fly was what I call a muddler nymph. And it, it had a kind of a interesting background, if you will. In fact, I'm not, not going to put that thread on there yet. And the background is that a couple of my favorite nymphs were that it was a sparrow nymph that was tied by Jack Gartside. And, uh, and the other one was the casual dress by Polly Rossboro. And those two kind of got together in my fly box and got together with another one of my favorite flies, the muddler minnow. And we ended up with uh, sort of a combination uh, with a muddler head. And, but the muddler head, because it was a fly, I wanted it to sink. I dubbed the head rather than 
doing spun and trim deer hair. Anyhow, our first tip though to start out is we wanted to make certain that the volume of lead was the same from on every, okay, this is a size 10, that every size 10 had the identical number of turns of lead. Well, how much is the right amount? Well, you, you just decide what the customer wants. But what I'm gonna do is show you a way to keep from uh, wasting a lot because here's the way most people do it. I'll show you, let's say that we want uh, eight or eight turns of, of lead on our, uh, on our hook. So let's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and there's eight. And so you trim off this and you trim off that right there with your scissors or your, or whatever. Well, I'm gonna mark those two spots right now with a felt tip marker. So we know what exactly we need for eight turns because we're gonna show you how to keep them throwing away all that lead. Doesn't count up to much until you do 50 dozen of them. And then you all of a sudden you've got a, a pretty darn big bunch of lead wire that you're throwing away or non-lead wire or whatever you wanna call it. The weighted wire. So right here is the length that we want and the other end is right there. So let's see. Let's just say for argument's sake that it's um, twice the gap of the hook past the end of the, past the, the length of the hook. So let me get rid of all this crinkled up stuff here and I'll show you a way to save a lot on that. So right here, I've got this whole big old spool of this non-lead wire just sitting right down here. And let's say I'm gonna sit down and do 20 dozen number eight or number 10 bodies or number 10 hooks all covered with lead and set aside once that they're done. All right, and I want it, and it's gonna be about that long. So I'm gonna take my rotating hackle pliers. They look like this. And I'm just gonna set this in place like that and start wrapping. And when it hits the end, it just pulls it out of the jaws of the pliers. I finish the twist there. I finish the trim there. It's soft enough, it isn't gonna hurt my scissors. And now I have the application of weighted wire that I want. It will always be the same and I won't waste a single bit. Now, does that make any difference if you're only gonna tie six flies for your own fishing and that's all you're gonna need for the year? Not a bit, but like I say, when you do 40 dozen, it gets to be an awful lot of stuff that you're throwing away. So let's uh, now get our thread and I'm gonna set this aside for a moment because I'm later gonna to have to have a wider thread because quite frankly, not that I can't use 6.0, it's because I am getting blind enough that I cannot see to uh, do a split thread dubbing loop that I need to. So I'm gonna use this 3.0 thread instead of 6.0 because I just can't see the 6.0 anymore to split it like I used to. Now I want you to notice though that I'm building up behind the, the wire application and I'm gonna really open up in wide turns over the, the weighted wire back and forth in wide turns what those wide turns are doing, if I don't do the wide turns, the thread just disappeared in, disappears in amongst the turns of wire. Okay, so what I would do, do at this point now is I would tie that off, put some glue on it, set it aside to dry, and continue on until I have my 40 dozen weighted pieces of hook. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to go ahead and tie a fly now. So let me go ahead and wrap to the back here because I'm going to take a piece of this kangaroo for the tail. Just like you would for a hare's ear nymph, we're just gonna take a piece of this and turn it into tail material. Get down here. So there's my little bundle of, uh, of hair that's gonna go on the hook. <clears throat> and you notice that I want the, the piece to, to set right in at behind that 
that lead wire, because you see how the two blend together and it makes a nice taper to the body. It doesn't make any difference whether I'm using kangaroo or, or something else. It just blends it all together so that I get a nice shape to my body. <clears throat> now we're going to put on our kangaroo dubbing. And I'm going to dub this on just like I did before. So we'll end up in um, the, the, the trash bin. And I'll just uh, kind of touch that uh, original bundle of fur that I cut off. And we'll just go ahead and start twisting our dubbing into place. And we'll just start at the front, start working our way to the back. Until I get right here to the back. Finish off and now I'm just gonna use the bare thread now to work my way forward, placing a rib in that nymph. And I'll just throw in a half hitch. <clears throat> because now I'm going to um, do a split thread dubbing loop, except it's not a dubbing loop. I'm going to call it a split thread application loop. But here's something I have to do even to accomplish that with this 3.0, is I got to use two pair of glasses, one on top of the other. I've got three power that I'm tying with right now. I'm going to put my twos over the threes. And so I'll be, ha I'll have five so I can do a split thread. And I'm going to use this. I'll show you how it's going to work here in just a minute. There, it's a split thread. And now I have to, oh shoot, I need some kangaroo. Dang, I should have done that before I did that, but then I would have had to try to hold the kangaroo. What you do is you take this, slip it through there and clip it to the back of that hook. That keeps it nicely open without getting it all twisted up. How many times have you formed a dubbing loop and then you hang the tool on there to go get your dubbing to slip into the loop and everything gets twisted up and then you have to untwist it before you can put it in. Sound familiar? Well, here's a way around that. Now I'm going to go over to my kangaroo and just get a bundle of the hair. Now I'm just going to release that. And I want you to notice that I've turned my, my, uh, my hackle pliers on the edge so I can kind of pull that apart. Now it allows me to set this in place. Now I'm not going to twist that. Instead, I want to rearrange this just a little bit. Uh, that needs to be just a little bit more there because all I'm going to do is use that to place my collar. There we go. Now, instead of spinning it, I now have my collar evenly placed around the hook. There'll be a few loose ones in there and I'll just pull them out. Now I'm going to put a dubbed head. It's fairly large and ugly right here. To, so it's shaped like a muddler head. So let me get another bundle of this uh, kangaroo dubbing and I'll get my dubbing wax out. <clears throat> I don't need a lot. I just want to kind of hold this in place. Put the cap back on. There we go. Now it's falling in line. Pull that back so I can wrap my thread head. Get my whip finish tool out. And this was until the bead head craze hit the US and I joined it. I still fish a few bead heads, but I've just recently gone back to fishing an old buddy, the, the muddler nymph. And there it is. 
ugly as sin catches fish like crazy don't know what else to tell you take those glasses off put on my other glasses so i can see the people oh there you are